All right, so we're going to get into some programming today on low back pain. We will look at some blood lipid levels as well. So we will start off by taking a look at a client who has the following scenario. 37, 31-year-old male, 5'8", 190, BMI of 29. He's an accountant, wants to get healthier and have a lower body fat percentage. He does have high cholesterol, shortness of breath, family history of heart problems, arthritis in his cervical spine and tore his meniscus in the left knee. Ever since high school, I've let myself go. I've had back two back fusion surgeries in 2017 due to herniated disc L5-S1. The pain is still there and I've just learned to live with it. The numbness down my leg comes and goes. I've had the nerve cauterized in 2017, but they said it, uh, it would eventually come back and I'd have to go and have the procedure done again. I'm now married with kids and have major financial restraints. If a genie were to give me one wish, it would be to have a block like chest and abs, LOL. Current program, he plays recreational sports once a week and do very minor at-home weights. Very minor? Uh, that, that, that. Do very minor. It just doesn't do a lot of at-home weights. So a couple of things I want to address. The first one being, um, what does L5S1 mean? That's going to be making reference to his lumbar region. We have five. Remember the little saying, you eat breakfast at seven. You have seven cervical ones. Ooh, actually. Uh, and then you have 12 thoracic. And then, so you have lunch at 12. And then five is when you have dinner. And that is your lumbar region. S1, you have your sacrum sacrum which has nine fused bones and so when they go in there and do a fuse your lumbar region they should have between one to three degrees of, of flexion extension between one another one uh, one two three four and five so it's going to give you five to 15 degrees of range of motion so when you see someone in a butt wink don't lose your shit and start commenting oh my god you have a butt wink you're going to die you got to ask the big question does it hurt and if it doesn't hurt, it's probably not that big of a deal. It's like knee valgus. If you see someone who has knee valgus, it doesn't mean they're going to die. If I'm coaching someone and they have a little bit of knee valgus, I'm just going to cue them to drive their knee out. If I see someone and they have some butt wink or spinal flexion, it's because the end of the femur is running out of room. And then we're going to steal that range of motion from the lumbar region. It happens a couple of times, not the end of the world. It's actually beneficial for, for those of us that are not under load. So just doing a deep squat. That's why I'll do that challenge a lot on our Instagram. Uh, but if you do see it and you think that it's a little too much or you're just uncertain, you can always instruct the individual to stop a couple inches short and you can eliminate that. Now, if they're a competitive lifter at that top level, then they will have to go to a certain depth. Otherwise, you know, there's no need to get into a, an argument with someone about, you know, that's too far. It's, if you have pain in your low back, your hip or your knee from squatting and you witness that uh, butt wink and it looks a little more severe, then I would just tell them to instruct them to not go down as far. So what can happen is when they fuse those, you're going to start losing range of motion. So typically, like I said, you have five to 15 degrees. Well, now when they fuse two of them, you're going to lose out on anywhere from two to as much as six degrees of range of motion. So it's going to be even worse. So, um, I did a post on one of our interns probably a year and a half ago, Megan, she has her own little positive fit community. And you can see, I do a drill with her and she has something that's uh, a guarding sensation because she had a, not sensation, but a phenomena from a surgery. So she got a L4, L5 fusion. And I did this little drill where I put her up against the wall and I put a, like a ball, it was a larger ball, like that big on her mid part of her back. So if you can imagine me on a ball, the wall right now, and what I would do is I would try to do segmental separation. So I would just take each spinal column and allow that ball to go away from the wall as I come down and I come down. And so the ball will start to come and I'll essentially try to touch my toes. And you wanna teach the individual to go one vertebrae at a time because we have 33 of them. We should be able to, within reason, have some mobility there. And so when I did this with her, you saw that it just hit like a, a part of her back where I told her to move and the whole segment moved. 
And that guarding is very common when you have some type of surgery. I think about it, you get knocked out and you have some foreign thing coming into your body, cutting you, fusing you, your brain's freaking out. Like what the hell is going on? It's like fireworks for a cat or a dog. It's just a clusterfuck. And so then afterwards we try to move and the brain is just going to be very, very guarded. And so that's something I would expect with this individual. And you can, again, you can go to our Instagram and the show fitness internship page and you can see the difference of the guarding. And then when I trained her and I helped with her understanding of pain, she was finally able to get down to significantly a lot deeper. So I'm going to try, I'll probably do something like that with this guy as well, just to see where he's stuck in his spine. Now, anything under no load, it's going to be on that person. So for example, if I were to ask someone, my shoulder hurts. Okay. When, when does your shoulder hurt? When I do push-ups. when was the last time you did a push-up? A couple of days ago. Cool. Can you get down on the ground and show me how you do that push up? I'm not concerned with that because it's something that they've done recently and they're comfortable with. I'm not going to instruct them my way to do it. I want them to do whatever they've been doing. So maybe it's a flare or whatever. I'm okay with it because I'm not loading it. It's something that they've done before. And so I would see what this individual, I'd have them stand up and just you know, do a quick flexion extension, lateral flexion and then compression uh, screen. That's what we're going to do. So I'll show you what that looks like. But I would do this right away. I would have them stand up and then I would have them see how far he can go down. If you can touch his toes, great. But typically what you're going to see is something like this. He's going to start pausing or going slow because of the hesitation. So that's my guard and flexion. Then I'm gonna have to come back, put your hands here, and then go extension to see where there's any type of pain. I'm gonna do the same lateral flexion. I can go back and forth until we find the pain. And then last but not least, I'm gonna do um, tension, not tension, but uh, compression. So you grab, I'd have a seat, grab your chair or your, and you pull yourself into it so you're compressing the spine. And then I'm watching him very carefully to see when he registers pain. And registry of pain is very simple because there'll be a hesitation. He's trying to touch his toe and he's gonna go, no, it's okay, I can push it. No, no, that's where you register it, great. So I'm gonna take a mental, or you can take an actual photo to see where he hits that. Then do extension, then do lateral flexion. And then I want you to do some type of compression. Let's see what irritates him. And that's all body weight so nothing's going to irritate him and it, depending on what his pain tolerance is now he has something that's referred to as central sensitization and sensitization it's a hard word for me to say but it's just think of it as i have this on my my truck i got an older tacoma 2007 and the light for low tire pressure is always on but my tires are fine it's just a, a fuse that blew so i'm aware of that because i've had it ever since i got my truck in 2010 so I'm not worried about it, but the same thing happens with the brain and essentially we register pain, especially when you go through a surgery like this. And so even though there's not any damage anymore, because we have an acute phase to an injury, which will be anywhere from maybe one to as long as seven days, where there may be an inflammatory response. But after that, it's, it's not acute. So there's not going to be any actual damage there. So we want to see how bad this, this guard is. So then what I'm going to do is I would see where there's some type of hesitation. I might go to the wall and do that ball drill because it's kind of a cool exercise to do. And then what I'm going to do with him, and I'm like, this is all part of, part of the, the first assessment. So he comes in and I introduce myself. I'm going to shake his hand. If the time's all right, I'm going to set expectations for today. Today, we're going to do an assessment. I'm going to learn more about your injuries. We're going to talk about your goals. And then I'm going to show you some exercises that we can do to get you that jack chest because that's what you want. And so I would do blood pressure because he, he has some uh, stuff up here that we want to address. And then after I gather that information, I would go out there and I'd show him some exercise that he can do regularly and that are now part of his daily routine. So before we get into that, I want to take a look at some hypotheticals for, um, let's see, this blood information. So let's pretend like this is your client and his blood glucose levels are at 102. BUN is bilirubin. Uh, creatinine is the byproduct of 
uh, breaking down of muscle. Don't confuse that. And it's not a knock to doctors. It's not fair to say this at all, but I have worked with some physicians that will misinterpret creatinine with creatine. So uh, think of it as like the more you work out, the more your shoes are going to run out, essentially like the bottom tread, right? So it's the same thing with exercise. The more you exercise, you would have higher creatinine levels. And so, you know, if they're off the charts, obviously you want to get that addressed, but within reason, let's say this is the norm, a little bit outside, depending on your last workout, your creatinine levels may be a little ele elevated. And so then they'll get into some stuff on here with sodium, potassium, but glucose levels, anything greater than hundred typically would be like pre-diabetic. So we want to look at how your body's responding to glucose. Your cells may not be recognizing glucose due to a lack of sleep. It could be your, your stress levels are elevated. Maybe you didn't actually fast for 12 hours. So there's a lot of different factors that would want to look into this. Remember, we're not doctors. We're not going to tell people that they are diabetic or not. But this is kind of cool stuff to review with your clients because they really appreciate it. Where most of your clients are not going to be, um, they're not going to have some. Can you guys see this still right here? Yes, no. Okay, so we have total cholesterol. When we get greater than 200, that's usually a sign that uh, you just want to be aware of. A 45 to 55 for your HDL levels would be considered normal. We're a little low, according to the ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine. Greater than 200 would be high cholesterol. Gr less than 40 would be a risk factor. Greater than uh, 152, 150 over here for triglycerides. And then greater than 130 for LDLs. Now, if we had an inverse here, so the HDLs, let's say they're like 65, 70, that would offset the higher LDLs. So think of like the HDLs of the cleaners, they call them the vacuum cleaners of the blood. So they are, they're thicker. They're, and when I say, when I say larger, I mean, we're talking on a, a, a nanometer, like very, very small. So look at like a, um, we'll use my cherries from my Manhattan. Hey, come here. So this little guy would be like an HDL. Whereas, and they would be like a little, um, uh, they call them fluffier. Whereas like um, a BB, like a, you know, we've all had that, it's, it's Christmas right now. So don't shoot your eye out with a little BB. That would be like an LDL. And those are typically heavier. And so when they go throughout the bloodstream, they are going to fall and then they're going to get caught up in the bloodstream due to any type of, uh, microscopic tears to the endothelial lining, which is like your heart. So think of like your heart and then you get little tiny tears in here in the arteries of the coronary artery. So then those tears are going to allow for the LDL particles to get stuck there, kind of like a dam. On top of that, if you have high blood pressure, on top of that, if we're overweight through obese, on top of that, if we're not sleeping, we're not exercising and we're really stressed, that's just the perfect, perfect storm, right? Because the inflammatory markers are going to allow for more damage of that lining. So think of it like, like a barn with wind and you start having a flap coming out and then the faster the wind goes, that would be like inflammation. It's gonna take more of those flaps and you're gonna have more of a mess. So it just gives us an idea of what's going on in the insides. And so, you know, we're not gonna, if the person wanted to get like an angiogram where they take a look at your heart, that's fine. It's, it's always good to see what's going on, but I wouldn't be too concerned with these levels. I would just want to focus on uh, increasing our exercise. So the HDLs go up, uh, making, when we exercise regularly, you're going to find that the LDLs start going down. And then I want to take a look at some of the other factors, sleep and stress and, and anything that could be inflammatory to this person. Um, it's just funny. One time I had a student who, um, it's kind of fun when you know this stuff because it makes you seem kind of powerful, right? But this one student, he was a young guy, his name was Craig. This was when I was at Dublin and he was 2010. And he, he showed me his profile and his HDLs were like at like seven. I'm like, Craig, how long have you been on juice for? He's like, what, what do you mean? What do you, what do you mean? He starts freaking out <laughs> because when your HDL levels go really low, it's usually a sign that you're on testosterone. And Craig was jacked. And when I saw those levels, I'm like, oh, that's like a, that's a, that's a tall test. Like 28 is, is not like to that level. So like you can just tell like, like think of like if someone were to have a fever, quote unquote, and it said like 120, you'd be like, that's just, that's, you don't see that. Something's really off. So when it gets that low, the HDLs typically would be a sign that someone's juicing. 
But the best thing for your high density lipoproteins or the good cholesterol is just exercising regularly. So we like to see this get up to 45, 55. And once it gets above 60, that's a really, really good sign. And then we'd like to see these ones normalize where they get down to less than 100 for the LDLs. Uh, triglycerides are fine. Total cholesterol is going to come down with the LDL as well. So that's just kind of, I, I really do appreciate the um, a ACSM because I think it just puts you on a different level as a trainer. And I hope that we're at a point sometime in the near future, you know, maybe three, five, 10 years where we're able to bring forth a team and be able to take blood and you're able to uh, interpret this stuff for your clients. And so if you're competent enough, I can look at those levels and say, oh shit, um, you know, Frank, you need to go to the doctor and get this stuff checked out because it's, it's alarming. And from what those levels I saw right there, nothing was alarming. Exercising regularly, everything's gonna be fine. So I wouldn't need to send him to a doctor, especially if the blood pressure was okay. Now the fact that he does say right here that he has shortness of breath, I would then send him to the doctor because that's not a normal sign. The cholesterol levels were fine. Having a family history of heart problems, again, fine, not concerned about it. Even the arthritis and the fusion stuff, fine. But the fact that he has shortness of breath, I want to learn more about that because that could be a sign that he is having some problems with uh, blood flow getting around his heart. So that would be the main concern that I would have from this information with the ACSM. Hey, uh, Chris? Yep. Yeah, the triglycerides, how do they, so the HDL, the goal is to have a higher number and the LDL is to have a lower number? Yep. So I like to think of that. I like to think of the H for healthy, L for lousy. You want a low lousy number, you want a high healthy number. Got it. And how do the triglycerides play a role in that? So it'd be like, think of it as like a, a squat, bench press and deadlift. So we have three different norms. They're just different markers. And so the HDLs are a marker of good cholesterol. The LDLs would be typically a, uh, a cholesterol that's a little different. Triglyceride, you have a, a glycerol molecule attached to three fatty acids. So it's just a different um, component, component, I guess you say, that we're looking at there. And when we say the glucose, is that the same conversation when you say, you know, after you work out, your glucose levels go lower? That's what they're looking at when they measure that as well? Yep. So what happens is our muscle cells, they have um, these glute receptors, and there's 12 of them that I'm familiar with. And these glute receptors, again, think of like a different exercise. So a bicep curl is one exercise, a hammer curl is one exercise, a reverse curl is one exercise. They have, they have different roles, a chin up versus a bicep. You know, they're similar, but they're different, right? So these glute receptors, they have jobs. And during an exercise, uh, during exercise, specifically with resistance, think of it as like these gates open up and these glute receptors are going to take more of these glucose molecules. The best analogy I can give is pretend like we're in class right now and I'm the, I'm the brain, I'm the instructor. And you guys are sitting down, you have seatbelts on and you guys are insulin. So what happens is you have vents above you and these vents are going to release balloons. And these balloons are glucose molecules of which we're going to release when we eat. So when these glucose molecules are released, then I'm going to tell you guys specifically the brain is going to communicate with the adrenal glands to, sorry, the pancreas to release insulin. So I'm going to say, hey, Mark, uh, get that balloon. So you grab that balloon and then you would bring it to the door. On the other side of the door, think of it like there's a, a worker for you, like FedEx or UPS. So they have different companies. There's 12 of them. So you give that balloon to that glucose receptor and then it has its job to do. If we just exercised, we're going to put that glucose into the liver and muscle as glycogen. If we didn't exercise, it's going to probably store it as fat. We're going to use some of those balloons immediately for a fuel source for our brain, our liver, kidneys, and just life at the moment. But what happens is when we test the blood and there hasn't been any f food coming in, what that tells you is if you have elevated glucose levels, it's like me telling you, Mark, to take that balloon to the door. And the analogy I like to give is you're drunk, so you can't find the door. And so you're bumping around and shit, you can't get that molecule out. So me as the brain, I say, oh shit, our blood levels are still high. So now we're going to go with Brandon, get that molecule. So then Brandon is going to take another one. 
but the cells become uh, intolerant and they can't get the glucose molecules out of the body. And the, the two best ways that you can get glucose out of the body are going to be resistance training, specifically concentrically. And the second one is going to be pharmaceuticals. And so we can knock pharmaceuticals all you want, but you talk about from an immediate basis, you can pop a pill and now all of a sudden everyone's sober and you can get glucose out of the bloodstream. I love that. But what I don't love is how doctors will prescribe it, but then they don't give you a long-term solution to help fix that. So, I mean, that's kind of a long-winded answer, but can you see why people freak out about, oh, glucose is bad, sugar is bad, because we don't understand all the biochemistry and the physiology and everything that's behind that stuff, because it's, it's convoluted shit. No, it makes sense. And you know what, Chris, uh, I appreciate you sharing this info, and for those that are on the call, uh, I sent Chris my information earlier. Uh, I, get my, my, I get my levels, my markers checked every six to eight months. And uh, it's been an eye opener for the last four years I've been doing it. I, I am very similar to this guy. I have low, I have uh, L4, L5 herniated disc. So I have that, that little fear every now and then of doing squats. Um, and when I was 30, I'm 45 now, when I was 35, I had, you know, a minor heart attack. Hmm. And, and when I had my levels checked for the first time, my triglycerides were in the 400s. Um, and that guy immediately wanted to put me on a beta blocker and I decided to go see a nutritionist, a registered dietitian and change my diet and not take the pills. And that, that within six months, I was able to get those triglycerides down under a hundred. Uh, and now I am relentlessly checking it all the time because I'm interested in it. And it is amazing how much, you know, the exercise and obviously I still got some room to improve, um, but checking them regularly is something that, you know, and look, I was more comfortable sending it to Chris today and I got more information from Chris than I probably got from the doctor, you know, um, which I, which I truly appreciate it because even the explanation that you're given now is the value of these classes. You know, it's not just about the programming. It's about the information that we get out of it. So Chris, I appreciate you taking the time to go through it. Oh, yeah, it's great. Uh, anytime. I appreciate helping you and I appreciate you. So, um, you know, the more that we can almost be in that capacity, it's not like I'm trying to step on any doctor's toes, but I think that if we want the respect of a fitness professional, uh, you're, you're going to gain it from your client when you're able to explain that stuff to them and they have questions and, and they, uh, and they have, uh, concerns. Cause a lot of time what happened, I understand, I, I feel for the practitioner because if you could imagine you have Maybe you see a hundred people a day when you see all these crazy levels, right? It's just going to be easier here. Take this pill, take this pill, take this pill. It's, they will benefit from it. Now, is it a good long-term solution? No, not all doctors aren't like that. There are some that, uh, you know, will take more time, but it's, it's, it's not fair for people to say that doctors are not educated. That's like one of the things that pisses me off. Like, Oh, doctors aren't smart today. Okay, how about you go to fucking med school and you compete at their level? I mean, it's so simple to point a finger at people and say that, oh, you know, they're they're corrupt. Yeah, there are corrupt doctors. There's corrupt basketball players. There's corrupt accountants. There's corrupt people everywhere. But I'm not going, I at least have faith in people and I'm not going to classify the whole entire medical system in the United States as corrupt. So we can do our due, di due diligence by learning more about the ACSM. And then you'd be able to, if you were to, so here's a perfect example. So my, um, let's say Mark is my client and I reach out to his doctor and say, Hey doc, how's it going? Uh, we have a common client, you know, Mark Anthony fitness, and he's hoping to accomplish ABC and D before I do that though, he did have uh, some shortness of breath. So I just wanted to make sure that he gets checked out and he's okay. And I really appreciate everything you're doing for us. And so I'd love to, whether if it's on a Zoom call or if you feel comfortable, take you out the coffee or lunch, pay you at an hourly rate, whatever that may be. And I just kind of want to pick your brain to see how I can make sure that the program that I designed for him is going to be appropriate and that he's going to benefit from this. The doctor would be completely shocked and be like, what, what the fuck? You're a trainer. Like, what? But if you were able to talk to him, like, yeah, his HDLs were pretty low. His LDLs were pretty high. And what are your thoughts? Like he would, you would get that guy's respect or that woman's respect and then more importantly, you need to offer your services and say, you know, doc, I know the trainers do have a bad rep, especially, you know, working with uh, Mark and his low back problems. I do work closely with physical therapists and other physicians and professors. 
I'd love for you to come in sometime and just take you through a couple of workouts. That'd be complimentary just so you get a feeling for how I train people. Cause I know trainers get this rep where it's like fucking annihilation and battle rope backflip CrossFit bullshit. And I just want you to see how I train. So if you have any other clients in the future that are similar to Mark and they could benefit from my services, I would love to help them out. And, you know, uh, just because of, you know, everything that you're doing and I appreciate you, I'd like to offer you a month free of training. So you go above and beyond. And all of a sudden now you take this physician who refers you a couple of his nurse friends, other doctor friends, plastic surgeon friends, anesthesiologists, clients. That one person is enough to fill you for the whole entire year, if not more. And then you get your business mindset on. You say, oh, shit, I'm going to take a couple of trainers from Shop Fitness, the internship. I'm having them train under me and I'm going to start my own little systems. And those are things that you're going to be able to do because you're a professional. And you're not looking for that quick, oh, 100,000 followers or $100,000. If you truly spend the time and focus on the foundation of this stuff, and I've never been concerned in my whole entire life ever hurting someone training them, even this person coming in. Uh, he's younger than me and he has knee problems, back problems, shortens of breath. At no point would I ever feel like, oh my God, I'm going to kill this person. So I'm going to spend a lot of time on two things here. What are the two things you think I'm going to focus on? Mobility? Mm -mm. Care less about mobility. Mm. Attention to detail. Well, his chest, he wants a block like chest. Bingo. We're going we're gonna to fuck up chest today. I'm going to give him one of his best chest workouts he's ever had. And number two? His abs. Yeah, his abs are important, yes, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help him. I'm going to educate him more than probably any doctor's done with his low back. And I'm going to probably get him feeling better in one session than he's ever felt in the last five, 10 years. And I'm confident in that because one, I've experienced it. Two, I've, I've worked a lot with people who've had these problems. And what we do is the behavior behind them. We baby as a physical therapist technician for seven years and in these clinics that I was at, the therapist would even baby the clients. And so when you baby them, the brain is even going to get even louder and protect itself. So when he comes in, I'll be like, dude, your back's perfectly fine. I'm going to help you. Uh, we're not going to do anything crazy. We're not going to deadlift anytime soon. We're not going to squat. We're not going to load that up. What I'm going to teach you is how to move appropriately where it's not going to flare it up. It's going to strengthen it. And you got to think of it like right now, you were bit by a pit bull. And your brain is freaked out anytime it sees a dog. So my job is to show you that dogs aren't bad animals. You just came across a shitty dog at that time. Not saying pit bulls are bad, but I'm just saying at that time. So I'm going to bring you a little golden retriever puppy. And this little guy isn't going to do anything, but you're still scared. And I understand because of the experience that your brain has had. But my goal is to get you comfortable little by little, session by session. We're just going to do a little bit each time. Um, and they'll actually do that with um, like PTSD, which I think is, fat. I love the brain, right? So when you have a, a specifically children and they have like a PTSD attack or something like that or incident, some of the best ways to bring people into animal attacks is to have the children watch other kids playing with the puppies. So then what it does is they see that, oh, okay, it's okay. Their fear level comes down and then they're more prone when they're comfortable to go out there. I'm not going to have this guy pick up any crazy weight. All I'm going to do is to have him move the way that he's moving right now, but we're going to do some strengthening drills. So I'm going to teach him how to get down on the ground without twisting, without rotating or bending his back. And so I do this all the time. I'll, I'll start there. So... We get down into a plank position. I'll teach him how to go here and then crawl out. Do a plank, hold, and then without pushing back and then how to get back up. So notice how I didn't get into any other plane of motion. It was just sagittal. That's what I want for now. I want him to be comfortable in the sagittal plane. I want to hold the plank. And if anything feels off, worst case scenario, put your knees down, nothing can happen. Now we're going to go with his name being Mark. Mark, I've done this with a lot of people, myself included. I've never once had anyone aggravate their back when they're working with me. I want you to know you're absolutely safe. Worst case scenario, something does feel off. You put your knees on the ground. 
you're good to go. So I went through worst case scenarios with him, which is nothing. There's a, there's a parachute that he has, put your knees down. And then I'm going to have, and I'm not going to touch him at all. So I'm going to let him be confident in his movement. And then I'm just going to watch him to see how he does it. Great. Good job. Now, maybe if he's doing well, I'm going to see how I can get him onto his back. And it's in, if they teach you how to get out of bed when you have low back problems is to use your knees. Because what happens is if you rotate like this, it can be pretty aggravating. So you teach people to use their knees to their chest and you roll so the spine is neutral. So I get them on the ground. I do a side plank. Worst case scenario, put your knees down. We're going to hold these for very short periods, five, 10 seconds max. And then I'm going to show them a bridge. Get your, your hump the air, squeeze your glutes really hard. And I want him to really squeeze because I want him to give me data. Pretend like you're on a date with your wife for the first time again, and you have to fart really bad. You cannot for the life of you fart. So you have to squeeze your ass as hard as you possibly can. Your butt cheeks need to be tight, 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 tight. And I want you to do, and I'll talk to him like this. It's called MVC, maximal voluntary contraction. And I want you to tell me which glute fires up first. Now, what I can then do, because he probably doesn't know where the surgery was done, if it was on the left side of the spine or the right side of the spine. So I can determine from this little exercise um, where the, the bulge is. So let's, let's look at like, here is his, are his uh, vertebrae. And then between here, you have the discs. So when you have a herniated disc, what you're going to get is either like a side over here, and it could be like this part that's coming out, or it could be this part. I don't know. And he's not going to know either. And so I can just that little test, he squeezes as hard as he can. And typically what you're going to find, it's like for me, my left butt cheek is a little uh, slower to activate. It's like turning on your oven. You got two, you turn them on full blast. The, for me, my left one takes a little longer to turn on. And that's just still the delayed neural recruitment from my injury a long time ago. That's 10 years ago. So for him, he's going to experience the same thing. So I want to see which side is delayed. And then I might um, just have him, I'll have him do more of these reps, but really focus on the one that is delayed. And then he comes out and then I'll teach him how to get out of it. And then I'm going to get him into a push-up position and we're just going to do some bird dogs. So he's going to be in all four, knees on the ground, lift his arm up. So my knees are on the ground right here as well. So this one arm up, arm up, puts a leg back, puts a leg back. And then I'm going to teach him how to do a bird dog. Hold that position. I'm going to give him slight little perturbations. There you go. All right, Mark. So here's the thing. This is your homework. Tomorrow, when you wake up in the morning, I want you to text me. There is a slight chance that your back could be a little more ir irritable. I want you to think of it like, like this. What are you at right now? And he's going to say a five or six. So you're here. Worst case scenario, you may be at a six or seven tomorrow. You're not going to be at a 10. It's not going to be crazy like that. You just may be a little worse. That's perfectly normal. You may even be a little less tomorrow. You may be at a four or five. Again, perfectly normal. I'm prepping for this. I don't expect the, the pain to go up, but I cautioned him. So if he were to wake up, which I've never experienced, but I just kind of plant that seed and he feels a little off. Oh, it's okay. Cause my trainer told me that's normal. So that guard's still going to come down. So when he reaches back out to me, I'm going to say, how you feeling? I've never had someone tell me that their back's been worse. It's always like, oh, it feels fine. Or most of the time it's, it feels a lot better. Like, holy shit. Like this is, it feels better than yesterday. Don't, don't get too excited. This is just day one. That's awesome. I want you to do the exercise that we did yesterday. That's our safe zone. Do that plank, do the bridge and do the bird dog and do it twice today. That's it. Cause you're going to see me again tomorrow. And I'm going to uh, then show you some other things. So when he comes in that third day, he did his exercises. So that those exercises that I showed him that he's doing now are in the safe bank. So when he comes back in, I'm going to show him a new exercise. Now, I'm not going to go to like testing transverse or anti-rotation. That'd be way too fast. What I may do is uh, maybe I have him do um, a plank for 15 to 20 seconds longer. I'm going to test the duration. Uh, maybe I do a, um, an appropriate incline press or something along those lines. I'm going to do an exercise that we haven't done before. But if it were to feel worse the next day, I can pinpoint that exercise. Because where we can get in trouble is he comes in the next day, I do a pail off, I do a farmer's walk, I do push-ups, I do bench press, and then do military press. 
And then he reports back to me, his back really, really hurts. Well, which exercise was it? I don't know. It could have been the compression from the farmer's walks. It could have been the military press. It could have been the incline press. There's too many things, too many variables. I don't know. So I'm going to show him the exercise that I know are safe, just to basically reiterate that. And then he reports back that he's good to go. Now I'm going to start showing him one new exercise every single time. And it's going to happen. Don't get me wrong. It's not like we're out of the clear. You've been in pain for the last five years. We're going to have episodes. Just expect it. It's like basketball. If you ever think that you're going to have perfect games with no turnovers, you're stupid. You know, we're going to have episodes and your back's going to flare back up. It's going to happen. And we're going to be able to reflect back on what it was. And then we're going to be able to strengthen that area so it doesn't happen again. And then the education behind the pain now is just a lot more thorough. And now he sees light like, okay, I'm going to get hurt again. I'm ready for it. It could hurt tomorrow. That's okay. I have a process. Whereas before the process was, let's do surgery. Here are some pills. You're fucked for life. Don't do this. So it's just, that's what calms down the brain. And the more you work with people who've had low back pain, it's in your words and your confidence. You're going to get better. We need to strengthen your core, your anterior lateral core, strengthen your glutes because they do play a role with the pelvis. Be a little careful of unilateral stuff in the beginning. Because when you do a unilateral chest press, what's going to happen is the core has to really stabilize and that anti-rotation could irritate his back. So I would feel comfortable doing like a bench press with him, but I'll put his feet on the bench to really enforce the posterior tilt. And then I would do an incline press and I feel more than comfortable doing that, but I want to have bilateral pressing. I wouldn't do unilateral. And then I would do uh, some, some push-ups. And I'll really hammer in the push-ups with the neutral spine, go to failure, go to failure, push, 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 rest, get back into the neutral spine, go again. And then when he reports back to me the next day, he's going to be all right. And then now we progressively overload. So you're going to do more sets. You're going to do uh, not too aggressive, but you're going to incorporate, the, you're going to increase the volume and you're going to get him a bigger chest. You're going to get him nicer abs. And more importantly, you're going to fix his back. Chris, I'll tell you this. Um, a while ago when I first started, you know, really watching your videos more often, I had that fear of my back. And I remember you sending me one text message or a note saying that, you know, that's just your brain, you know, or something to that effect. And I have not touched a back squat in years because of it. But you got me into where you put the weight out in front of you uh, to help stabilize your, your back. And that has really helped me because... Now, even a day like today where I do goblet squats, today I was able, you know, I was staying in the 20, 30, maybe even 40 range. And today I was able to go into 70 pound goblet squats with no issue to the point where I'm probably a couple of weeks away from getting into a back squat. So I absolutely believe what you're saying is absolutely true because, you know, that fear that I had has gone away because I can feel you know, those muscles that probably were not working and now working just because I did it progressively though. You know, I wanted to go back into that back squat, but I just know that my body's not ready to talk to each other yet. And now I feel the difference in three months has been tremendous. So absolutely. Yeah, in, in lieu of the holidays, it's kind of like in Home Alone 1 when Kevin goes down to the basement, right? And the, the furnace thing lights up and he thinks it's going to eat him and everything. And then he goes down there that one day and he's confident. He's just like, shut up. And it goes down. I mean, that, that's our brain. You know, our brain is going to try to protect us because when you did hurt yourself, you were in agony and it hurt and it sucked. And so your brain is trying to protect you from that experience again. And so we have to be not necessarily confident, but you have to strengthen it and you have to be okay with movement. And when you're taught that, you're, it's only going to get worse. You're, it's like an e-break. It's just going to put that sucker in. It's going to be really hard to move. So I think your words and listening to your client. Now, with that being said, pain is multifactorial. So if this client came in and he was like, I've done planks in the past. They really, really hurt. I don't want to do them anymore. I need to respect that. And I need to listen to him and not like, oh, no, no, no. I, I know everything. Let me show you. Just do it. There's going to be a, a guard there. So based on the screen that I did and his openness for movement, it may just be today we walk around the block and that's going to be okay. And you're going to have a little bit of pain. Let's just learn to walk 
15 steps further with that pain, then we rest, we drink our water, because you're going to have some people that have just really, really bad levels of pain, eight, nine, 10. And so we're just going to have to learn that pain to that degree for now, it's not going to get worse. If you're at a nine and it sucks, we're going to walk to a 9.3 and then we're going to rest and it's going to come, it's going to come back to a nine. So just remember that we're going to get back to that pain threshold. But just like the first time someone gets into cold water, it fucking sucks. It's freezing, right? But as you get used to it, the more times that you do it, it's not nearly as bad. It's the same thing with the body and the brain. So we need to expose and teach your brain that everything is okay, but it's going to take some time, depending on the individual's tolerance and their experience. So do you guys have any questions on uh, back pain? I love back pain because... Uh, when you're uh, when you've been told when you were I was in my mid 20s that I'm never gonna be able to run squat deadlift jump any of that again and the doctors wanted to do this to me as well they wanted to do a fusion of the peripheral nerves and when they do that they will regenerate and come back but it's like a it's a half-life so the first time they do it you may not experience pain for two years but then it's going to come back in 18 months. Then it's going to come back in a year. And it's going to come back in eight months. So you have to go back in there and constantly get these surgeries. And they put this long ass needle. And I was just fortunate when I worked with the physical therapist and um, when I was in high school and college, they said, never, ever go under the knife when it comes to the spine. Don't do it. And that was just one piece of advice that I've always lived with. And so I would never do that. And I was in a position where they wanted to do the surgery on me as well, but I didn't. And I just, I stuck it out and I, I was a meathead and I pushed through it and it sucked. And there was a lot of long nights that I had. I, luckily for me, I don't have that addictive personality in the sense where I didn't get addicted to painkillers because a lot of people are you know, committing suicide and overdosing because of that stuff today with the opiates. I was fortunate enough to come across the right folk. Uh, there's a great book out there called Crooked. And uh, like the cover is uh, it's like a little stick figure and it has a little, uh, what are those things called? It's a, a, a puppet master really great book it just kind of exposes the industry for what it is and how you can get through this you know even nasim will tell you right that 80 percent of people have low back pain well you're going to come across these scenarios and reading a book like that is just going to prepare you for what to come across but really aggressive therapies that they'll do and they'll talk about craig lebenson he's the la sports guy sports spine in la i've gone to him and he's awesome uh they'll talk about Stuart mcgill he's one of the the McGill three are game changers. And then there's a good book called, um, uh, blah, blah, blah. there's low back disorders from Dr. McGill, but that one's a little convoluted. There's another one that he wrote about back pain with Brian Shaw, I believe. And that's a really good one. And just talks about how you, know, you, you can get through this. So any other questions about low back pain or anything like that? Hey, Chris, quick thought. My um, my physical therapist that helped me through my bicep surgery, you know, we, we developed a good relationship where now he's, like you said, he's like on my team. I use him as a resource when I have certain clients. And um, he got me into certain hip uh, stretches that have helped me tremendously with my back. And, uh, you know, from yesterday's class, it kind of tied into it. But he gave me four or five stretches that, you know, I do religiously every day in the morning and at night. And uh, I can feel even when I lay down and do just a regular hip flexor stretch where I pull my knee up, you know, my my one side, I could never get it even halfway up than my left side. And uh, how much of the hip do you feel contributes to the lower back? Because I almost feel like my lower back pain has gotten better because of the stretching, number one, and number two, because I'm loading it up with, you know, goblet squats. And, you know, he would say to me all the time, motion is lotion. So most people with lower back pain, you know, they, they just, they put it to sleep. They don't use it again. Yep. How are your thoughts about the hip? That's time? great. That's uh, the second or third time I've heard that quote, motion is lotion for the body. And so you got the, the psoas, it runs off the L1 through S1, and it's going to come down into your, it's when your main hip flexor. And if we're not addressing that via concentric loading or just, you know, stretching, you got to remember stretching is calming to the nervous system during the time it may hurt, but it's, it's like a little mini orgasm for the system. When you get into that deep stretch and then you release, you feel a lot better. So your tolerance is going to come down. 
And so if you can set the expectations of the client that here's a couple of, here's one stretch I want you to do on day one, as well as these strengthening ones that are going to help. And they're just going to parlay report back to me, see how you're feeling. And if you're good, then we're going to show you another stretch. And like every time they come in, I have nothing against stretching. I just think that in the, in the minutia of it all, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, I think that strength training is going to be my go-to and that's just my background. I'm not downplaying stretching or mobility stuff, but I feel that like if we had a hierarchy, it's going to be strength training and then down the line it would be those things. But if your client is open to stretching, I mean, there's, I love stretching for my clients to do as homework, you know, in your story, every night you could post, here's a stretch of the day. And then your clients can do that. And if it helps them, it helps them. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, it's concentrically loading. What would so, be an example? So when you go for a run, you're, there's no load on your knee to drive. It's just repetition versus like what I did today is I put the bands on my, my toes and then I brought my leg up. So oh, now okay. there's a concentric shortening of the muscle under load. And God. that is how a muscle is going to adapt and get stronger. But we typically do not do that on the flexors, on the adductors, upper traps. A lot of the muscles that we classify as overactive we don't load them. We don't get them stronger. So they're just, they're kind of like crying. They want help. They want to get stronger. Got it. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. And nope, we just got guys today. So we are going to have a little five o'clock call after this. So I'm going to end this one. And then we're going to hop on for those that want to join in for our year little anniversary. Love to get any of your feedback, stuff you liked, where you see yourself in 2021. But that's the conclusion for low back pain. Have a great rest of the night.